she passes away and he is really dominated by grief. He is so sad about his wife's death and he has trouble in his life. And eventually he is able to get help because his wife leaves him a note that he ought to be starting a new adventure. She left this note when she was dying and she left it in a picture album. And so he finds purpose in helping a bird and helping a young man, and it's a beautiful ending to the story. But love doesn't die when a person dies. I want to talk today about grief and loss, and I'm going to share some of the details of my own experience as a 14-year-old when my dad suddenly passed away. One of the things that happened to me was I like Carl in the movie, was overwhelmed by grief at my loss. In fact, I remember thinking, why can't I just wake up and know that this was a terrible dream? I was wishing it was just a bad dream instead of reality. But of course, it was reality, and I needed to deal with it. And I grieved so hard that I concluded something was wrong with me. I didn't understand what grief was like, and I concluded I was faulty. And that message sunk deep inside of me and affected me for decades. I didn't know that I was experiencing normal grief. One of the things that happened to me was in my first relationship when I was in high school, which was very intense for a while, at one point I consciously thought, she could die on me. And I backed off after that, kind of sending a double message. I want you and I don't want you. My sense of safety had been shaken when my dad died. And so I tried to kind of take control of things so something bad would not happen in the future. There are three things that I did not do that are critical when it comes to grieving well. The first one is I did not apply faith and hope to the grieving process, at least not for long. And that's our subject today. But the two other things that I did not do was I did not feel my feelings and process the grief, nor did I have the support of another human being who would walk beside me and help me through the process. This is why I am passionate about this subject of grief and loss. So we're going to look at this. What does grief look like? And how can we apply faith to help us through the grieving process? And how can we apply hope to help us through the grieving process? Now, David's description of his anguish that he felt regarding his enemies is something that grieving people can relate to. Listen to Psalm 25, verses 16 and 17. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. Relieve the troubles of my heart and free me from my anguish. There are some words that grieving people can definitely identify with. Lonely and afflicted, troubled heart, anguish. I want to give you five common things that people experience in the early stages after a serious loss. And I'm using the acrostic scene, S-C-E-N-E, -E, to help me remember what these five things are. S stands for sleep. Sleep patterns are disrupted, and this is normal. For a lot of people, they cannot sleep. Other people sleep more than they normally do. C stands for concentration. People find it very difficult to concentrate in the same way that they used to during this early season of grief. E stands for eating. Eating habits change. Some people lose their appetite. They just don't feel like eating. Other people overeat. N is for numbness. I believe that numbness is a protection against overwhelming emotions in those early stages of our grief. But if that numbness continues for weeks and months and even years, it could be a sign that we've not processed our grief and something is wrong. We may need some help. 
I read about a couple who lost their 18-year-old son to a drowning at Cannon Beach a few years ago, and the Oregon Live interviewed the parents, and the man said this, describing numbness. He said, life was like a glass of water. No color, no texture, no taste. E, again, the last E is for emotional upheaval. That is, our emotions are all over the board during this early season of grief. And somebody has coined the phrase ambush of grief. That describes when you're ambushed by grief. For example, it may be of days, weeks, even years down the road. Say you're in a grocery store and your loved one loved olives and you were in the olive can section of the grocery store and suddenly you are overwhelmed with sorrow because your loved one lo loved olives. Or it may even be some random reason that you don't even know. You're just cruising along in your life, even years down the road, and suddenly you are just overwhelmed by sorrow. Ambush of grief. And of course, with all this going on, Fatigue is also a result, and so we can experience that in the early stages of grief. And all these things are normal. No, you are not crazy, and no, your loved one is not crazy if they go through these things. Grief is a God-given process, I believe. It's uncomfortable and up and down, but it is meant for our good. So how can our faith help us in grieving? When a person is in pain, they often ask this question. Is this going to last forever? Will this ever get better? Because they're thinking, I sure hope so, because I don't like the condition that I'm in right now. Will it get better? The answer is yes, but not necessarily in the way that you think, because we really want God to do a removing job in our lives, removing the pain, and God wants to do an improving job in us, making us better people. Now, I want you to imagine a jar, and that jar represents you, and that jar is filled with material to the top. And let this represent the flu. You ever have the flu, and it just dominates you? You, you're laying in bed and you're thinking, I need to get up and take a shower, for example. And an hour and a half later, you're still laying in bed. You just don't have the energy. Your flu is dominating you. But a week or two later, imagine an empty jar. Same size. The flu is gone. There's no material in it now. It's a thing of the past. Well, we expect grief to be the same way, that at some point, it might be weeks or months down the road, the sorrow, the grief no longer impacts us. We, don't, we aren't sorrowful when we think of our loved one that we've lost, but this is not reality. This is not what happens with most people. Instead, what we can hope for is, imagine the jar becoming a larger jar Sorrow is still there, but we grow in Christ and in our ability to hold and carry that grief. We become more and more conformed to the likeness of Jesus. And so, yes, life does get better. We do have joy and purpose again, and we may also have sorrow coexisting with that over the loss of our loved one. So by faith, we can know that our suffering is not just random bad luck and with no meaning to it, but that God is conforming us to the likeness of his Son. God is conforming us to the likeness of his Son through the grieving process. Romans 8 28 and 29, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. 
we see here that in whatever we face, God is actively working for our good, and the good that he's working for is conforming us to the likeness of Jesus. That's true when we are grieving over some kind of a loss. You know, my kids, when they were younger, used to love to go to the Springfield Library. We lived in Springfield, and it wasn't just because of the books and other things that the library had in it. Right outside the library, there was a, a mural, a mosaic, that was the city sign of Springfield. Now, that doesn't sound very exciting to kids, but here's how it was made. A former city employee had cleaned the sewer system he had jet cleaned it and he'd taken objects that he found in there and put it together into a mosaic and it was the seal of the city of springfield and it was a beautiful work of art 4200 pieces 37 inches in diameter weighs 70 pounds here's some of the stuff that was in this mosaic a gold nugget a diamond pin a tiny revolver, false teeth, a jackknife, a French perfume bottle, coins, clay marbles, a 1942 dog tag. There was also lots of broken glass and dice. And a lot of this stuff, if you piled it on a table, would look like junk. He took all of this seemingly random stuff and made it into something beautiful, the seal of the city of Springfield. This is what God is doing in the hardships in our life. He's taking things that may seem random, useless, not belonging in our lives, and he's using them to make us a person of character, to, to conform us to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. I want you to think of something that hurts in the moment, but later on it produces something good. Listen to what the author of Hebrews said in Hebrews 12, 10 and 11. Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Can you relate to that? No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So through our pain, he produces something good, a harvest of righteousness and peace. You know, I read this story of people who were trying to ship Atlantic cut cod from Boston to San Francisco. And this was in the 19th century before there was a Panama Canal. So the first thing they tried to do was take the cod they caught and pack it in ice and send it clear around the South American continent by ship. And do you think that it was fit to eat by the time it got to San Francisco? The answer is no. Well, someone else had another idea. Let's ship the cod in tanks of water. And so they did that. But those fish turned out pasty and relatively paceless. Or excuse me, rhymes with paceless. Tasteless. Somebody else had another idea. Third time's a charm. Let's ship the cod in tanks of water. But this time, let's put catfish in with them. Why catfish? Catfish are the natural enemies of cod. The cod had to fight for their life the whole time on the trip, staying active. And it turned out those fish ended up tasting great. Turned out that they were better when they had been challenged. I'm better when I'm challenged. I become better, and you become better when you're challenged as well. So our grief, our sorrow, and any other hardship is not without purpose. God is shaping our character as we cooperate with him. He's shaping our character through the process. And there's a bonus. Not only is he shaping us, but he's preparing us 
to be used in other people's lives. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. Someone said he's turning our mess into a message. So here's another way that our faith, in this case our hope, can help us when we are in the grieving process. Will it ever get better? Yes, it's going to get a whole lot better in eternity. So the last point here is our hope in eternity can sustain us as we grieve. If you would do this right now as you're listening, would you snap your fingers if you're able? And now would you blink your eye? That snap of your finger and that blink of your eye is like this life compared to all eternity. Very, very short in comparison. This is what John wrote in Revelation. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with man and he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. So just as a student can endure dead week or finals week or the end of a school term knowing that spring break is coming or Christmas break is coming or summer break is coming or graduation is coming, we can endure hardship in this life knowing that there is coming a day for those who trust in Christ when there'll be no more sorrow, there'll be no more pain, there'll be no more suffering, and that can strengthen us today as we face sorrow, hardship, loss, grief in our lives. Now, the Thessalonians were concerned, worried about believers who'd already died. What would happen to them, they wondered, and they asked the Apostle Paul, and the Apostle Paul tells them in 1 Thessalonians 4.13, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Now, it doesn't say we don't grieve. It says we don't grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. You see, when you infuse hope into the grieving process, it changes it and it makes it better. Some of you are familiar with another movie, uh, and the movie is about a professor who is a professor in Japan at Tokyo University. Is, he is in agriculture science, and he has a dog, and he loves his dog. He's attached to his dog. His dog is attached to him. When the dog gets to be old enough, about two years old, he goes with him to the train station. He catches the train, the professor does, by himself and goes to the campus and teaches. And then he comes home in the afternoon. And what would the dog do? Come and meet him at the train station every afternoon when he got home. Well, one day, this professor had a cerebral hemorrhage, a, a bleed in the brain, which took his life. He never returned home on the train again. His dog, who loved him, who by now had a new owner after, the, after his owner's death, showed up every afternoon for the rest of his life. That dog lived 10 years, so showed up about 8 years every day at the train station, waiting patiently in the afternoon for his owner to return. That inspires me. I want to do the same thing. In my sorrow and in my grief, I want to be longing for my owner, Jesus, return, even though it seems like it's a long time in coming. Now, that dog's owner, Hachi was the dog's name, never did return. But Jesus has promised that he will 
return and he's going to usher in a much better day. And this helps us in our discouragement, in our sorrow. As the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 18, Therefore we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So to sum up, I talked about what grief is like and described it for you. And we need to know that you and your loved ones are normal if you experience these things. We talked about how to apply faith to our, the grieving process and specifically this. God is conforming us to the likeness of Jesus' Son. He's molding us and developing us through the grief process. And finally, we looked at the idea that there is hope in a better day that God, Jesus, has promised to us where there will be no more pain, there will be no more sorrow, there will be no more suffering, and we can look forward to that day and be encouraged by it. Now, before I close in prayer, I want you to know that if you're interested in this topic of grief and loss, I've done a lot of training on it, and one of those trainings is on my website. And that website is heartrevival.net, and you go to resources and then video messages, and that seminar or workshop is the very first thing up. It's actually what I did for the Churches of Lebanon at Crowfoot Baptist Church back in March uh, of uh, 2020. 23. Let's close in prayer. Lord Jesus, first of all, I want to lift up to you those that we love, maybe those that are listening, who are in the midst of sorrow. You're a man of sorrows, and you understand, and you care. Would you comfort them? And would you, through this process, develop in them and in us, when we are going through sorrowful things, character, Christ-likeness? And would you give us hope that there's coming a day that will be much better and that that day lasts forever? And would you let us all know that when we go through the very painful and upsetting process of grief, it's normal and it's a God-given process. Thank you for your love and your care in our lives. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.